Good evening. Welcome to the America House Munich YouTube live stream. Thanks for joining. My name is Dominic. I'm the program director at America House Munich, and it is my colleague Joanna's and my pleasure to host tonight's event. Before we get started, let me briefly walk you through some organizational information. Good evening. Welcome after the welcome house. remarks, um, sorry, um, after the welcome remarks, um, our lecturer will talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and give us a presentation on tonight's topic. During or following the lecture, you are more than welcome to contribute and ask questions either via the YouTube chat function or in case you're just watching and do not have an account, no problem, you may ask your questions also via email. Please send your emails to program at americahouse.de, subject line question for choice. I'm repeating, that is program at americahouse.de, program with double M, America House, one word and written in German. You will also find the email address in your YouTube chat. We will then collect your questions and directly ask them. Why we will be trying to ask most of your questions, we kindly ask for your understanding. If your specific question is not being asked, we'll try to finish in a timely manner and thus limiting our questions is necessary. Thank you. Um, but now it is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Choice Marie Masheben. Choice Masheben uh, recently retired as a Curitas Professor Emeritus of Comparative Politics and former director of the Institute for Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Having spent over 18 years living and or researching in Germany, her early work focused on new social movements, peace, ecology, feminism, anti-nuclear protests and neo-Nazi activism, German national identity and generational change. She then moved on to European Union developments, citizenship and migration policies, women's leadership, Euro-Islam Euro debates and comparative welfare state reforms. Her books and monographs include only to name a few from post-war to post-war generations, changing attitudes towards the national question at NATO and the Federal Republic of Germany, becoming Madam Chancellor, Angela Merkel and the Berlin Republic, which was published in 2017. And there is a manuscript in progress about the dialectical identity of Eastern Germans, assessing the impact of unification. Professor Masheben, has secured numerous international grants, including fellowships from the German Academic Exchange Service, the German Marshall Fund, the Fulbright Foundation, and the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. She has served as a visiting scholar at the Chinese Academy for Social Sciences, at the GDR Academy for Social Sciences in East Germany. She served as a Ford Foundation Fellow and has enjoyed visiting professorships at Ohio State University, Berlin's Humboldt University, and at universities in Erfurt, Stuttgart, and Tübingen. She is also an adjunct professor at the Research and Research Associate in the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. And now, without further ado, we will focus on tonight's topic, making democracy work again, what's at stake in the 2020 US presidential election. Dear Joyce, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Dominic. First of all, for the kind invitation, guten Abend allerseits, or guten Tag meinerseits, if you're on this side of the Atlantic. It is a bit strange, and I am sure that some of you will find my presentation a bit harsh when it comes to the current occupant of the White House, Donald J. Trump. I would like to point out that I am a professor, that I have been researching these topics for a long time, and I really believe that hard times require hard facts. I may overwhelm you a bit with some of the statistics in my PowerPoint. I assure you there won't be a quiz right afterwards, but I want you to understand that I come to my conclusions based on my observation of the facts of the case, the data that I've been able to collect, and some of my life experiences regarding a few of these harsh topics. So thank you all for tuning in nonetheless. Now back in January, when I first 
agreed to give a talk reflecting on the November 2020 elections, there were still 10 candidates participating in the Democratic presidential debates preceding the primary. Most of us could move about wherever we wanted. The economy was humming along. We had record low unemployment and even crime rates were declining. I plan to focus on four topics that I thought would nonetheless dominate the presidential election campaign. Those topics were Trump's cruel and regressive immigration, asylum, and detention policies, climate change and youth mobilization, as you've seen in Europe, the Fridays for Future activities, Medicare for all versus Republican efforts to dismantle the Affordable Care Act in the United States, women's reproductive rights, which are being chipped away state by state en route to a major Supreme Court battle that's now being influenced by two religiously zealous Trump appointees. Well, since that time, the world has been turned upside down by a global pandemic, and my own country has been torn apart by righteous anger over police violence and structural racism. The last time we were this divided as a nation, we stood on the brink of a civil war that turned out to be the bloodiest and the deadliest war in our history, if we look at per capita deaths. For the last three or four months, most of us have been more or less locked up inside our homes. Our economy stand on the verge of another Great Depression and fears of crime have been completely displaced by massive urban protest against the heinous police murder of George Floyd in what used to be known as Minnesota Nice, Minneapolis. About a month ago, I looked up the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858 involving the race for the Illinois Senate, during which time the Republican candidate, Abraham Lincoln, declared, quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he stated further, this government cannot endure permanently, half slave and half free. His Democratic rival, Stephen Douglas, denounced Lincoln as a dangerous radical whose advocacy for racial equality and the abolition of slavery would disrupt and possibly destroy the union. Now Douglas won that state Senate election, but he so divided his own party that he lost the presidential race two years later, rendering Lincoln the 16th president of the United States in 1860. This is one of those rare occasions when it might be comforting to see history repeating itself, at least in terms of the electoral outcomes, but not of course in relation to the violent conflict between the blue and the gray states that followed much less between the red and the blue states. The events of the last few months have not completely undermined or invalidated the campaign topics I had originally planned to address. But the corona pandemic has certainly turned some of them upside down and inside out in ways that no one could have anticipated. So I'll begin by addressing the potential impact of demographic change on the November 2020 elections with a brief discussion of new efforts to suppress voter turnout. I'll then discuss the negative, albeit glaring light that the corona pandemic has cast on the US healthcare system, or shall I say the lack thereof, in places where insurance options and acute care facilities are most needed. Next, I'll consider the extent to which other corona related developments have ripped a very big bandage off a festering wound of structural racism in the United States. And then I'll conclude with a few thoughts on the state of democracy, hoping to leave time for discussion during which, if necessary, we can zoom in on the data. I'm now going to shift to my PowerPoint and I wish you the best of luck in understanding all of the things that I have put into it. Now, let me start with the question of demographic change in the United States. Although immigration has temporarily fallen off the electoral radar screen, 
demographic change will have a dramatic impact on who votes and why. Our population growth has slowed significantly ever since Trump began slamming the doors on new arrivals. Migrants have, on average, more children than more established families. The long-term consequence is that the baby boomers who are aging at a precipitous rate will have to lean ever more heavily on the shoulders of smaller, younger cohorts in order to have them finance our social security and Medicare benefits. We're now seeing a population shift to the South and the West, and this is likely to cause re cost Republicans a reallocation of congressional seats should the 2020 census ever finish. The redistribution of the House of Representative seats will come at the expense in the old industrial Northeast and Midwest. Whites now comprise only about 66% of the eligible voting population. Children will be at the forefront of this racial and ethnic change. And so we're also seeing a diversity gap emerging, not only between whites and people of color, but between older and younger generations. More than half of the US counties, over 550 of them, have lost at least 5% of their residents since 2010. The share of the population over the age of 65, to which I must count myself, is increasing at the fastest possible rate. Now the influx and the citizenship of the many people of color and ethnic minorities who were born on US soil has raised a number of issues regarding uh, voting reform as well, electoral reform. The national debate over electoral reform has taken an unexpected turn in part because of Corona. We are still stuck with a totally dysfunctional electoral college that allowed two men who lost the popular vote to take the presidential oath during the short span of 20 years. But the COVID-19 epidemic might just make it possible for us to overcome a growing problem of voter suppression across the individual states. Now this voter identification slide shows that some of these efforts have been in effect since dating all the way back to 2014. 35 states have laws requiring some form of identification at the polls as of December, 2019. Now that doesn't seem strange. But over the last 10 years, another 18 states have passed laws requiring state-approved photo IDs. Now, this isn't a problem for those of us who are privileged enough to have a driver's license because that already qualifies as a state document and it has our picture. The problem is for those who don't drive. First, they have to get themselves to state offices where they're often required to supply proof of US birth. Again, we don't think of this because most of us were probably born in a hospital, but older rural residents may have been born at home and therefore don't have official birth certificates. Getting these state approved IDs is also a burden for people with disabilities, nursing home residents, you can just imagine. Since 2016, the Supreme Court has rolled back rigorous monitoring requirements that were imposed on the Southern states, especially after the 1965 Voting Rights Act. These states are supposed to provide preliminary ballots in case they question the IDs, but there are always problems at the polls, depending on personal prejudices of the poll workers themselves. Let's just quickly, I'll just put these up, I'm not going to read through them, but there have been many informal tactics used to suppress voters' attendance and participation in direct election. Not only the ID requirements, but lots of things going on at the local poll level. Five states currently are conducting all elections entirely by mail. Colorado, Hawaii, Oregon, Washington, and Utah. California has announced that it will join them in November. Another 21 states, have permitted mail-in ballots for smaller elections, things like school board contests. Now, 
I experienced the primaries here in Maryland and they automatically mailed ballots to every registered voter in the state. You mark the ballot, you put it in a special pre-addressed envelope, you sign an affidavit on the outside, and then you either return it by mail or drop it off at a polling place by a given date. Although Trump himself votes by mail from Florida, he attacks all efforts to expand this right to all Americans, claiming erroneously that it will induce massive fraud. Mail ballots, he said, are very dangerous for this country because of cheaters. They go collect them, end quote. Now, the irony is that voter fraud occurs in less than 0.04% of all the ballots submitted. And ironically, the biggest scandal to date took place in North Carolina in November 2018, where Republican campaign workers went door to door in poor neighborhoods collecting absentee ballots, promising to turn them in. That was totally illegal. If you have an absentee ballot, you must mail it or drop it off yourself. One district in North Carolina had to repeat the entire election. A representative poll from March 2020 suggested that 72% of the Americans, including 65% among Republicans, support a mail-in ballot option for November 3rd because of their fear of corona. Two thirds also want the elections to take place over a two week period to eliminate long lines of polls or to avoid excluding people who do shift work, can't get childcare, things along those lines. This spring, corona induced lockdowns led the states of Ohio, Michigan, Delaware, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, and South Carolina to permit mail-in ballots for the primaries they postponed. Republican legislators in Wisconsin nevertheless obliged their voters to stand in line for hours outside of polling places. And what we see happening here is that they've shut down polling places, arguing they want to keep people safe. But these shutdowns are occurring in largely communities of color. One district, for example, in Georgia lately, had over 16,000 voters just for one polling place. Now, Corona has also raised some eyebrows regarding the woeful state of American health care. More than 20 million U.S. residents secured health insurance for the first time under the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Black Americans, children, and small business owners were among the top beneficiaries, especially after 37 states expanded Medicaid to those right at or below, uh, living at or below 138% of the federal poverty level. After Twitler took the oath of office in January 2016, Republicans tried seven times to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act as they had promised during their campaigns. They failed to do so seven times when they even enjoyed majority control of both the House and the Senate prior to November 2018. The midterm elections proved that all kinds of voters had learned to love Obamacare a lot more than they thought. In fact, Republican promises to keep on trying to do away with it cost them their majority in the House in November, 2018. Since then, they've resorted to the Supreme Court to try to chip away parts of the bill piece by piece. Now, Corona has paradoxically accomplished what Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell could not. The Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that about 27 million people out of 158 million people have recently lost that health insurance provided by employers due to their job losses between March 1st and May 2nd, just when they needed it most. And this covers another 78 million in terms of people's dependents. 46% of the people who've lost their insurance coverage were located in California, Texas, 
Florida, New York, and North Carolina, the states hit hardest by corona. 43% of those lost their health insurance in the 13 states that did not expand Medicaid. The corona mortality rate for Black Americans is 2.4 times as high as the rate for whites and even higher than it is for Asians and Latinos. Paradoxically, 1.4 million healthcare workers lost their jobs, up from 42,000 reported in March. 135,000 of those were in hospitals that had eliminated elective surgeries, non-emergency treatment, which is what those hospitals were using to cover the cost of everyone else in the emergency rooms. Now, many places have experienced critical shortages of PPEs, the protective uh, equipment, masks, ventilators, but our current president is exporting ventilators instead of sharing them with what he perceives to be democratic states like Michigan. There's less public discussion about people in places where corona infections have not yet peaked, although the last two weeks have obviously seen some dramatic surges. Where we haven't yet seen real surges are in the rural areas. About 60 million US residents, one in five, live in rural areas where their only option is a local hospital without a critical care unit. 179 rural counties have lost their critical care facilities between 2004 and 2014. 2019 was a record year for rural hospital closings, 18. Another 20 have closed already this year. 45.7% of all rural counties don't even have hospital-based OBGYN critical care services anymore. Now, I really wanna say a few words about the dramatic conditions encountered on the reservations. The Navajo Nation is about the size of West Virginia, covers about 27,000 square miles, spread across Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. It's home to approximately 175,000 people. There are only two hospitals available at all to the Navajo Nation, which have about 60 beds each, of which eight are for critical care. By May 6, the Navajo Nation had reported 2,654 confirmed corona cases and 85 deaths. Those numbers have skyrocketed since. The second hospital is one open to the general public and it's the only one available for 100 miles. It terminated contracts for 14 of its operating room nurses and then 30 of its other hospital employees tested positive for COVID-19. The infection rate in the Navajo Nation is 3.4% compared to 1.9% for New York State. And we know how devastating that effect was. As you can see in the states such as Arizona, New Mexico, or Wyoming, the death rates are completely, and the contagion rates are completely out of sync with their total share of the population. The good news, the only good news thus far, is that now all states are required to report coronavirus data based on race, ethnicity, age, and the sex of individuals who've tested positively. Tested, that is, if tests are available in an effort to provide lawmakers with a better picture of the course of the pandemic's evolution. This of course ignores the millions of people who still have no access to test in this country. Let me turn now to the economic impact of corona. As we see over the last two months, many states, the brown ones here, that had already begun to gradually open up are now moving towards heavier shutdowns all over again. This is not only going to hurt the small businesses that were just gearing up, it is going to wipe out a much larger number of those businesses. 
The Congressional Budget Office projects that this virus could cost the U.S. economy $7.9 trillion over the next decade. That's just trying to fix things up. But as usual, the pain won't be shared equally. Many of us thought that Hurricane Katrina had taught us most of what we needed to know about the vicious grip of structural racism in American society. We saw these really tear-inducing photos of Black Americans who were stranded for days on bridges and highway overpasses, some of them in wheelchairs, due to a lack of preparation and, more importantly, emergency transportation. Untold numbers of elderly and disabled drowned in nursing homes and hospitals because they could not be evacuated. Now, unemployment has hit over 40 million, over 20% exceeding the Great Depression. And while some people, roughly 4 million, got those jobs back in the temporary openings, they are about to lose them again. While the gap between black and white employment rates had just begun to narrow in 2019, black unemployment remains high relative to other groups. The District of Columbia, where I'm located, has a black unemployment rate that is 6.5 times higher than the whites in the resounding neighborhoods. Mississippi, nine times higher. Pennsylvania, eight times higher. The highest Hispanic state unemployment rate is found ironically in Pennsylvania, 6.4%, followed by North Carolina. The highest white unemployment is in the state of West Virginia, registering about 4.7%. And these figures are from early May, so before we had the full impact of corona. Although women comprise a majority of the least privileged laborers, they've been hit the hardest, just as the she-session, or we could call it a she-pression, was giving us a new appreciation for these millions of underpaid, underinsured, child care workers, store cashiers, and health aides, not to mention our grade school teachers. Boy, have people come to appreciate teachers. These are the ones facing the greatest risk. These are the people, the women, earning minimum wage. For many, the $600 per week supplement in unemployment benefits totaled more than their pay as full-time workers. Black and white gaps persist. We see the groups hardest hit by unemployment have been black men, black women, Hispanic men, and Hispanic women or Latinx as most of us prefer to call them now. The no eviction rule under the first care package passed by Congress is about to expire. Texas has already announced that it will no longer allow people to remain in their homes if they can't pay the rent for a second month in a row. Now this is going to produce new waves of homelessness exactly at the point where we're all supposed to be hunkering down and adhering to social distancing. We know what kind of catastrophic developments have occurred in prisons, nursing homes, and homeless shelters already. Although we only spend 15 cents of our discretionary money on education, again, we're gonna expect our children and grandchildren to pay off the massive deficits and debts our exploding national debt of over $25 trillion. I'm not even sure how many zero, zeros that one has. And yet we owe this debt, not so much to Corona, but to the so-called Trump tax cuts. He increased defense spending. He has excessive secret service bills. And what better time for a trade war with China? Our precarious economic circumstances virtually guarantee that the most vulnerable groups in our society will soon witness even bigger cuts in social services than the ones we had already seen prior to the corona epidemic after 2016. Now, I want to say a little bit, these are again some figures I'm just going to leave up there for a bit, but I also want to talk a little bit my personal experience in Ferguson or in relation to Ferguson, since structural racism has now become a core element of this 
larger electoral debate. I, my university was, as you see, I have a lot of data trying to persuade you. My university, University of Missouri in St. Louis, was only about three miles away from Ferguson, Missouri. In fact, I had guest lectured there at a community college. I had a number of students who were from Ferguson. And so when the Michael Brown killing occurred, this thing, all the unrest that was taking place, it was happening practically in my backyard. Now, one of the interesting things I wanna show you here is that there was a turnaround, a total shift in the racial ethnic composition of the population within almost a 10 year period. A neighborhood that had been 85% white in the 1980s suddenly went down to 45% white in the year 2000, dropping to 29% white by 2010. Whereas the black population went from 14% to 67%. That is a phenomenal shift. And I can tell you why it's shifting. Because the state has cut whatever funding was available, but more importantly, our schools are financed by property taxes for the most part. And if you were born into a lousy neighborhood with low property values, then of course you get lousy schools, which exacerbates the lousy employment situation. So increasingly in the state of Missouri, we had people fleeing some of these neighborhoods where the public schools had deteriorated, we call it white flight, for the more white suburbs. And that left Ferguson with not a lot of disposable income. Just as importantly, what was happening in Ferguson, you see uh, the deterioration or the, the gap in the quality of life. If you look at the gray circle, the life expectancy for Clayton, that was practically my backyard. In fact, my son went to school in Clayton for four years. So there's an 18 year life expectancy gap between Clayton and Ferguson. And this is a distance of less than 12 miles because I drove it every day from Clayton up towards Ferguson in order to teach at the University of Missouri St. Louis. This is insane. How can we tolerate this kind of gap in a single city, in a single county, much less in the state, much less across a nation that we think of as united? Well, Ferguson had to compensate for a lot of these missing revenues by stopping people, racial profiling for traffic violations. And when people accumulated two or three tickets and couldn't pay, they would be fined additionally. And when they couldn't pay the fine, they'd be put into prison for a while. And Ferguson, like a number of other very small communities in Missouri, was using these traffic violations based on racial profiling to finance city government, one of 93 little metropolitan areas with its own mayor, with its own city council in the larger St. Louis County, St. Louis city area. Even though blacks were targeted for these police stops, we see that in one of three cases, if white people were stopped, they were carrying something or doing something illegal as opposed to only one in five for the black community. So this is one of the things that then unleashed the violence that we saw. Now, Derek Chauvin had no qualms about looking directly into someone's running video camera during his agonizing eight minute and 46 second summary execution of George Floyd. Based on his other 20 violations of police rules involving people of color, he never imagined that his performance that day would unleash the largest protest wave this country has experienced in more than 50 years. The war on drugs in the 1970s actually morphed into a war against US citizens. The 1997 National Defense Authorization Act allowed one could even say encouraged local police agencies to start purchasing surplus weaponry from the Pentagon at discount prices. Over $5.1 billion worth of armored vehicles, of M16 rifles, of military aircraft and mine resistant ambush vehicles. 
really? 117 universities bought some of this surplus material. Over 20 school districts bought some of this school, uh, some of these kinds of materials. This was not a war on drugs. In these minority communities, it is clearly perceived as a war on minorities per se. War metaphors have been driving our public police debates for decades, but we never expected a US president to call out not only the National Guard, but also the border control and Homeland Security and the regular army flying helicopters here right over my building towards the city downtown in order to respond to a peaceful protest in the nation's capital. Defense Minister Esper referred to these as battle spaces. They used five different kinds of military and police forces. And these people had no name badges and no insignia that could be used to hold them accountable later on. The US used to serve as a model for community policing, but we've obviously lost our world-class standing on that front. The first police violence reporting requirements were introduced by Obama in 2014. But the bad news is that it only covers about 40% of all the US police agencies. And many discrepancies exist in the standards criteria they use. On average though, we can see from this graph, since 2013, on average, over a thousand black deaths have occurred per year based on police use of lethal force. Less than 22% of all police agencies ban chokeholds, Vergegriff of Deutsch. Police charged with the murder or the manslaughter of black or minority citizens up to now have been acquitted in 99% of all of the cases. Cory Booker and Kamala Harris have now proposed a new law in order to ban chokeholds, not just to urge departments as the Republicans would have it, but to ban chokeholds as well as a lot of other police reform measures. We have people talking about defunding. We can come back to that in the discussion. I think that's an unfortunate word. I think reallocation might be a better term. But now let me come to some of the other questions that we might be facing in this election. We've reached another critical juncture in the history of my country, a nation that used to stand as a democratic role model for oppressed peoples everywhere. Even if we failed to live up to the pledge we had to recite every day in school as children, stressing liberty and justice for all. Yet here we are again, stuck with a completely dysfunctional federal government with a president who in my mind is mentally unhinged and with cabinet officials completely devoid of substantive expertise. Indeed, many of Trump's self-serving interim appointments were rejected even by Senate Republicans during their initial advise and consent hearings. Now they're being accepted without a whimper the second or the third time around after Trump randomly fired and replaced others. This is the way the people city has looked throughout the protest era. You can see the black area where they've inserted this fence all around the White House. The strip leading up to 16th Street has now been declared Black Lives Matter Square. And people have kind of used this fence as they did in China during the democracy protest as a, as a great wall kind of democracy wall protest arena which is why Trump then decided to have parts of the fence removed because it was being used by these protest groups to advertise their own causes. Our federal district and appellate courts are being packed with Trump supporters and ideologues, many of whom were actually labeled unqualified by the American Bar Association. That did not stop Mitch McConnell from calling session, the Senate into session at the height of the corona crisis not to pass a fourth care package, but to give his personal friend a federal judgeship without the need for a two thirds majority vote. Republicans George W. Bush, Mitt Romney, Colin Powell have now publicly announced that they will not vote to reelect Trump. Five retired generals have renounced Trump's various leadership failures. 
at least these executives have decided to take a stand against various trumpeted lies and conspiracies. Joe Biden has finally come out of his own corona cocoon in order to make a number of semi-public appearances, critiquing a lack of leadership. His greatest test will simply be not to make any dumb mistakes, like the one he did saying Black people who would not vote for him could not really be Black. Most of the people in this country whom I know are willing to vote for literally anyone but Trump, which means Joe Biden could have saved all the money on his campaign posters. Now, let us recall that Martin Luther King Jr., and this was a shocker for me to think about it, was assassinated 52 years ago, and he was only 37 at the time. This means that at least half of the U.S. population has no direct memory of the civil rights movement, much less of Martin Luther King Jr., much less do they know anything about how hard it was to secure the 1965 Voting Rights Act that is being seriously undermined by recent Supreme Court verdicts. Martin Luther King, for a lot of these young kids out protesting, black, white, brown, is only somebody they were required to write a ritualistic essay about once a year during Black History Month. A recent school survey showed that some kids even think Eleanor Roosevelt was the woman who refused to sit in the back of the bus. Now, young protesters are gonna to have to find their own heroes and sheroes and role models, but at least they've grasped something that Marx and Engels pointed out about the same time that Lincoln was getting ready for his debate with Douglas, namely the idea that the economic superstructure determines the base of all other social, cultural, and race relations. Voter suppression is real. I mentioned the Wisconsin primary in April where people were forced to stand in line for hours. The same thing happened in Georgia last month. One polling area had to stay open until 12.36 a.m., even though polls are supposed to close at 7 p.m. People waited in line two to eight hours just to vote in a primary. Using smartphone location data, one study in the, after the 2016 election found that voters in black neighborhoods wait on average 29% longer than whites. Poll workers couldn't even find the passwords for the new computerized voting machines. The person who arranged for those machines and who also struck 1.4 million voters from the list in Georgia was none other than Brian Kemp, the state secretary who was simultaneously running for governor and did win that election. People stood in line two to eight hours in over 100 degree temperatures for a primary. Now it turns out that $65,000 mail-in ballots weren't even counted, including 15,000 in Pennsylvania and 8,000 in Georgia. In Montclair, New Jersey, 1,100 ballots were rejected because they arrived too late because we've got a shortage of postal workers because of the corona epidemic. 1,100 ballots were not counted and the mayor won by 195 votes. So we know that voting matters. And the bottom line is, it's the turnout, stupid. The very people who've taken to the streets over the last month are the ones who hold the key to turning this country around. 20% of Blacks did not participate in the 2016 presidential election. About 50% of the millennials did turn out about 41% of Latinx did turn out. My gosh, what kind of a democracy is this where not even 50% of the population goes to vote for the president or for the other national offices in the House and the Senate? Policymakers in the United States need to recognize that there can be no race justice without class justice. As Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
So that's what I've tried to prove to you this evening with all these facts and figures I've thrown at you, leading me back to the question, what is at stake in the 2020 elections? My short but profound answer, practically everything, because all of these issues are intricately connected. The list includes our faith in democracy and the rule of law, our trust in core political, economic institutions, not to mention police agencies across the country. Also at stake are our hopes regarding many public policy reforms that are needed to secure economic justice and societal peace. These ongoing street demonstrations, and they are still going on, though we don't read, hear about them as much in the news anymore. These are the modern day political equivalent of the canary in the coal mine. As Lincoln noted during that debate, quote, did we brave all then to falter now? When that same enemy is wavering, dissevered and belligerent, if we stand firm, we shall not fail. Wise counsel may accelerate our mistakes or delay it, but sooner or later, victory is sure to come. I have some further proof that voting matters. The year 2018 brought an unprecedented number of women and minorities into the US Congress for the first time, 147. The Nevada State Legislature, the first one in the nation, now consists of 50% women, 50% men. We have some very powerful black female mayors in Chicago, Atlanta, and yes, even Ferguson, Missouri. More women are running and winning than ever before. 490 are out there campaigning right now. And that gives me some hope. And so I will end on this happy note and thank you for your attention. Stop the share. Thanks. Are we back? I think we can't hear you, Joanna. I hear you. You hear me? Can you hear me now? I hear you. Do you hear me? I hear you. Okay. Sorry about okay. that. I have some microphone issues. All right. Okay. Well, then once again, <laughs> I wanted to thank you very much for your very lively and um, informative talk, Professor Musaben. You give us a lot of food for thought, and I think we have a lot we can discuss. And I just wanted to open the floor again to everybody who's on the YouTube chat. Feel free to send us your questions there or to America to program with two M's at americahouse.de. We do have one question already from the YouTube chat from our audience, and that is, why do you think that Republican leadership, including senators and representatives on the whole, stay silent concerning Trump? Is it blind party loyalty or fear of Trump reprisal? That is a, a profound question that we've been asking ourselves for the last four years. And I think the very simple answer is that these people are afraid of losing their own elections back in their home districts because they come from districts where Trump enjoyed very strong support. We could not believe that somebody like Lindsey Graham uh, or Ted Cruz, who would use some pretty nasty names for Donald Trump before he was elected, would suddenly just pay. There was a very interesting article by Ann Applebaum in the Atlantic about what causes people to kind of collaborate under these circumstances. And it is quite striking that Mitt Romney, a white, rich white guy, we would expect to be more of a Trump fan, as opposed to Lindsey Graham, the military specialist, the military veteran who was opposed to Trump at the beginning, now sort of bending over backwards to be his ally. But the primary fear that these people have is that they will lose their elections back home. 
As Ted Cruz once said before he ever decided to run in the Republican presidential primary, I only have to satisfy 65,000 people in my district. And what happens in the rest of the country doesn't bother me. That's all one had to do in order to maintain a seat in the House of Representatives. There's also a lot of money behind many of these ventures, but I really think it's just their fear of losing their own seat. Mitch McConnell is under a threat right now. A lot of these people, there are, will be uh, Susan Collins, the more mad, moderate of the Republicans. I mean, we're all dumbfounded when she, first of all, didn't vote in favor of impeachment, but also supported the Kavanaugh nomination and two or three other things that have happened since then. So now the more moderate of the Republicans, they're also facing threats, but these time the threats are gonna be coming from Democratic candidates. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, it jumps back to like when you were talking about the militarization of police. Um, and it says, you mentioned you do not like the term defund the police, but would prefer we allocate their resources. And this person would kindly ask you to elaborate about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think when younger people say it, they do mean completely do away with police. But I guess I'm, I'm old enough, I've been around long enough to understand that there is a legitimate role for police in our society. We do have mass shootings. Chicago has had more deaths over the last week and a half, gun shootings, including three children under the age of 11, random drive-by shootings. So we need the police for some things, but the real problem that we have is that they have been trained. A friend of mine in Germany pointed out that our police go through eight months of training as opposed to German police, two and a half years. And during those eight months of training, Every police candidate on average fires over 9,000 rounds of ammunition. In Germany, over a two and a half year period, they fire up to 1,000 rounds of ammunition. That is, first and foremost, we're giving our police gun training. And I understand why the police are afraid. We have more guns in this country, 390 million guns, than we have citizens roughly 335 to 40 million, depending on whether we wanna count the people without documentation. So this is, the, every police is afraid that when a person puts a hand towards a pocket, there could be a gun in it. But we're sending police into situations that require social workers, mental health workers. Uh, the police are being sent in with no arrest warrants. Uh, no knock warrants, excuse me. This is one of the things that Cory Booker's legislation would outlaw. Brianna Taylor in Louisville, a woman who's a, an essential coronavirus health worker was shot in her bed asleep because police had a no knock warrant, burst in the door. The, her friend pulled a gun because he thought his house was being broken into and the police just started randomly firing. Now, you don't even have to knock to burst into a person's house. There's something obviously wrong with a lot of the regulations we have governing the police. So reallocation would put a lot more services into teaching police how to de-escalate. We'd have to put a lot more police on the ground, walking around in those neighborhoods they're supposed to be serving so they get to know the locals instead of both sides automatically being pitted against each other as potential mortal enemies. So that's what I mean with reallocation. We would have to put more money into some of these police services, again, for the training, but we'd have to take some of the money out that we're using now to buy weapons and to give them all this weapons uh, training in order to put it into some of these social service orientations. Thank you very much. You hear me now, right? Yes. I was having microphone issues, great. Mm -hmm. Well, um, now that we're talking about police brutality, I might mix a couple of questions that we got from the audience. Um, one was, why don't more Americans see these facts and how come there are still Trump supporters left at all after all of this? But also, um, that brings me to the point of Trump's language of maybe distracting people from the facts by using language that's very divisive, calling protesters against police brutality 
calling them angry mobs who want to end America. So how effective do you think this language is for people who maybe aren't as aware of the facts and who are on the fence this coming election? Let me start with the first question about, you know, why don't people see these things? Because our neighborhoods are segregated. No question about it. And I don't blame slavery. I, I think it's sort of historically not helpful to keep going back to our original sin of slavery. These laws, these things that have held Blacks captive to poverty and undereducation and a lack of employment opportunity, these are all the outcome of the Jim Crow laws that were introduced in the 1920s and the 1930s and then continuing through the 1940s. Ferguson is one part in St. Louis. I can mention Kirkwood. I can mention a lot of other neighborhoods where they literally decided that Blacks can live on these streets and Whites can live on those streets. And the Blacks got a separate but not equal school and the Whites got a separate but not equal school until 1954 when the court said separate is not equal. You have to go everywhere, almost everywhere, in a car. You can't live in St. Louis without a car. And so for somebody like me, upper middle class white girl teaching at a university, even though 30% of my students were minorities, we just avoid those neighborhoods. You just drive your car to the places you need to go and you never go into those parts. Everybody knows one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in town, one of the most dangerous streets in town is going to be called Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. So it's the residential segregation that leads to the poor schools because of the low property values and then the blindness, they, the race blindness, it's not neutrality, it's just blind to these things. Now, Trump supporters disproportionately live, they are disproportionately male, they are disproportionately white, they are of a certain age group, and they also are disproportionately people who do not have college educations or advanced degrees. All right, so we know that these people are also concentrated in the small states, in the rural states that again, had a disproportionate number of delegates in the electoral college. Hillary Clinton won three to four million more votes as did Al Gore. And yet by winning certain states, combinations of little states managed to secure a majority in the electoral college. So that's the first thing I would do away with the electoral college. Let's have a direct presidential vote. So these people, again, don't see these problems of the big city. My brother, he's a Trump supporter. In fact, my whole family voted for Trump, which is kind of debilitating. And you can imagine how hot our Thanksgiving dinners are. But in any case, my brother's out in Montana. He has mountain lions. He has coyotes. He's got a 650,000 acre ranch. They have rattlesnakes. Sure, he needs guns. But people living in Washington, D.C., People living in downtown St. Louis, Missouri, do not have to kill rattlesnakes. Why do people need guns in those areas? Why can't we have laws that say there is a national registration system? So the people who are still Trump supporters only hear what they wanna hear, only see what they wanna see, because now we have on top of this social media that allows you to live in a bubble and only communicate with people that you share things with. Remember in the old days when people read real newspapers? I grew up in a city that had three newspapers and then we were down to two. St. Louis went down to two. And in a newspaper, the first two paragraphs had to have who, what, when, where, how. And then if you were a more Republican or a more democratic oriented newspaper, you would interpret those facts differently, but at least we all started out with the same facts. Social media does not require anybody to use any facts, much less the same facts for a discussion. So that's why people continue to support Trump at that level. That brings us then to his language. They feel that they've been left behind. I see a lot of parallels with AFD voters in Germany. They feel that they're in these rural areas. Their towns, their hospitals are closing down. Their kids, they all wanted their kids to go to college. They went to college, but you know what? If you go to the university, 
You don't want to necessarily come home and be a farmer in Podunk, Iowa anymore, or in South Dakota, where it's got really extreme winters. And so their kids aren't coming home. They don't have grandchildren to play with. And they really feel, I think, oftentimes that too much of this life is changing too quickly and, and they're being left behind. So the more vicious and vehement and vociferous the rhetoric Trump uses, the more they feel like somebody is starting to understand their pain and they can stick it to the people they think are responsible for a lot of that unhappiness or misery or lack of opportunity in their own lives. When in fact, I will say this as a political scientist who's been actively studying these issues for over 40 years, you know, the people they vote for are the very ones who are making their lives miserable. Trump tax cuts only benefited people who were in the top 1% or a certain group of people making between 50 and $80,000. People making less than $50,000 a year, which is close to the median income, their taxes went up. They, their taxes went up because when the income taxes went down, the state raised the taxes. They increased the sales taxes to compensate for the loss. My taxes went up over $16,000 because you can no longer write off all these expensive conference trips and things like that as a normal business expense. So they hear that their taxes were cut and they don't understand why they're not doing better. And then he uses this language, this scapegoating, and they think, yeah, yeah, they know who's causing the pain in their lives. And it's simply not true. Yeah, um, talking about scapegoating, um, we have another question that uh, we received via email. Um, given the president, uh, the president's current intent to focus on his re-election by increasingly attacking the Democrats' leadership rather than acknowledging the severity of the coronavirus and taking leadership of efforts to control its impact, what do you believe will be the key core policy issues in this election? As I tried to indicate, I find it very hard to separate these issues from each other, but Corona has had an impact on the economy. It's had an impact on uh, health insurance or the lack thereof for the people right when they need it the most. It is going to affect small businesses in extraordinary ways. It's even going to start affecting our trade relationships. If each country feels like now they need to start producing a lot more of their own stuff in, in case of a crisis such as this. So I, I think the economy has always been the key issue in American politics. I know Europeans would like to think we care a lot about the rest of the world and foreign policy and Trump withdrawing troops from Germany and you know dissing NATO. Americans are just too busy worrying about their everyday economic security. We don't have a generous welfare state. We have what I call an ill-fair state. You have to lose everything before you can qualify, even for something like Medicaid, which those states refuse to expand. They would have gotten subsidies from the federal government, and even there, they wouldn't do it. Food stamps, the, the, the SNAP program, all these have been cut in the last two years. And so we have people lining up at food pantries and the food pantries and the churches and the charities are simply overwhelmed. So the fact if a lot of these people are not reemployed by November, and I sincerely doubt that they will be, that will be a turning point for many of these so-called independents who are people who don't read very much about politics. Otherwise, I don't see how they could not have made up their mind one way or another. And yet they go into the voting booth at the last minute and say, oh, well, I guess I'll vote for this person. While the rest of us who have looked into the facts, you know, we just stand there hopelessly and knowing that this is the way the institutions were established. So I, the, Obviously, economic issues uh, are going to feature here large. And if this surge in the corona continues, then the healthcare issue is going to loom ever larger. I think right now it's already a very hot topic, in part because people have lost their health insurance in the states 
where they are most affected right now by the corona epidemic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So we, in the case that Trump does lose the election and Biden wins, we have a person from the audience interested in, in what that might look like. And if you see a Sino-American Sino -American relations returning to the pre-Trump era if Biden wins the presidency. No, those are two very, very different kinds of questions. Let me go with the Sino one first. Um, things will change. Things will need a long time to go back to normal. Uh, certainly Xi Jinping is not your standard Chinese ruler or not the kind of Chinese ruler we had all sort of become comfortable with over the last 30 years. So he's got an agenda, a dictatorial agenda of his own as does Putin, as does Erdogan, as does Orban. We are not gonna be able to change those things overnight. There will be some easing of tensions if only because it's the American soybean farmers, the American pig farmers who are, are now having to destroy their crops or put down their, their pigs because they can no longer export these things to China. And Trump has somehow uh, convinced himself that when you raise tariffs on those products, the Chinese are writing him a big check every month. This isn't true. These tariffs are being paid by Americans who are importing those goods. And pretty soon all the prices at Walmart are gonna go up because so much of their stuff is imported from China. So there will be some easing there, but please don't expect it to go back to being all the uh, fleet of white Eierkuchen anytime soon. In terms of Biden, I can tell you, I've, I've been through a lot of elections where I've done nothing but hold my nose and vote for the uh, lesser of the two evils. And I'm kind of feeling that way this year again. We can't do any better than to pick two old white men to run for the presidency of the United States. A lot, of course, will depend on Biden's choice of a vice presidential candidate, but that will only bring out some of the undecided or otherwise very skeptical and inclined to boycott millennials. That will, I think, affect the, the voting behavior of those younger citizens. For the rest of us, as I said, you know, just any, I mean, he could pick and Azel, he could pick a donkey at this point as his vice presidential running mate, and I would vote for Biden. And I and I think I am representing a large number of, of my kind out there in academia. However, uh, Biden has been pressured over the last two months, this agreement, this committee, this task force they formed with Bernie Sanders to move you would say, or they're saying to the left, I would say we're just kind of moving back towards the center. We were never left and Biden is far from a socialist or a communist. In fact, not even our Green Party would qualify as socialist or communist in this country. And so I think there will be enough issues on the democratic platform that can attract the progressive, to somewhat more radical, but there's still that very young contingent. The Black Lives Matter group actually called for a vote boycott in 2016 because they did not like Hillary's stance on the, uh, there was a domestic violence and police reform, a justice reform bill that she had supported that they thought was not going far enough. So that's what helped to account for this 20% drop among black voters in the 2016 presidential election. So I'm not sure we're gonna win all of these people. I hear there have been at least three young black women I've heard on TV recently here on the local news saying, well, if Biden doesn't completely defund the police, I'm not voting for them. They think Biden can do that. The police are run by the states and by the local governments. Biden wouldn't have that power even if he wanted to. And so there's a, an unfortunate lack of ignorance about how the legal, how the legislative process works. But more importantly, there's a sense of impatience that rightfully belongs to the young. But they've come to think that life is an app. They think you press a button and democracy happens. Or you go out and you protest and you make a demand and they all turn around and get in line. And that's just not how democracy has ever worked. So 
Biden will be pushed into adopting more liberal perspectives. He's not going to talk about Medicare for all, but he's certainly talking about expanding the Affordable Care Act. We know that the uh, if we have another round of Supreme Court justice appointments, and that will be coming sooner rather than later, that there'll be a little bit more uh, hope on that front. We know that in terms of job creation, infrastructure programs, Biden will be all over that because he likes representing the working class and likes to talk up his working class background. So there are a lot of things that will change, but it all depends on who else comes with him into the House of Representatives and the Senate, because you won't achieve any of this if there's still a Republican majority in the Senate. Thank you. Uh, another question that we received via email is, it's like basically circling back to Joe Biden again, and you were talking about women candidates before. Um, what's your educated guess? Joe Biden hasn't picked a running mate yet, but has repeatedly been urged to make a pick, and it seems evident it will be a woman. It should be a woman of color, but he seems hesitant, and the Democratic National Convention is coming up on August 17th. And why do you think this is, and why, and who do you think will be, will he most likely pick? Uh, I'm not going to answer that last part. <laughs> I, I am not an American government specialist. I write about East German identity. I write about the European Union. I write about von der Leyen. I write about Angela Merkel. So I am giving you the benefit of my expertise as a comparativist because I've always had to include the United States in my sample of countries. Um, Biden probably has not made a definitive decision because there's a tremendous amount of vetting that these people will have to go through to make sure that they never smoked a joint in public, to make sure they never, you know, called their mom a bad name and things like this, just because all this stuff can be played up in social media. So there will be grounds for conspiracy theory about who was born in the United States and who wasn't born in the United States. He's probably got it down to about three people by now, but we aren't going to hear this right away because obviously they want the newsworthy bump that you get out of making these kinds of announcements. They know that people will then start paying attention to the Biden candidacy a little bit more intensely as we move towards August and certainly then August, September. Um, there are, I know, two people I would prefer but I think I'll keep those to myself because I don't think one of them would prove electable by many of the other sort of moderates to independents, people who haven't made up their mind yet. And the vice presidential candidate, I'll repeat myself here, is more likely to make it or break it with these younger voters who might still be angry that Bernie does not get to be their candidate. All right, thank you. We're going to take just one last question. Due to time, we're going to have to slowly um, close, but um, we'll take one last, and this is from the audience in the chat. In case of losing the presidential elections in November, do you think it is likely that Trump will refuse to step down? And if so, what scenarios will occur as a result of this refusal? Well, if he does lose the election, uh, he has no alternative but to step down. He has not been a Putin or an Erdogan who could more or less randomly change the Constitution. In fact, there's been some talk, could he even postpone the election? Absolutely not. It says right there in the Constitution, the president shall be elected national elections every four years on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November. I think if given a couple of the recent Supreme Court verdicts, which show a respect for law and a respect for the Constitution, no matter how much abuse John Roberts, Chief Justice, might have to put up with from uh, Trump, that we have still functioning democratic institutions. What is being shipped away is our faith in those democratic institutions. So the, the institutions will kick in. The Supreme Court would certainly make it impossible for Trump to remain in the White House. And I, I'm just optimistic or, well, I'd be more concerned, I think, about some of these militia groups who'd be running around the streets with their AK-47s thinking that they might need to take 
the law into their own hands. But even there, we still have military forces that believe in upholding the Constitution as these generals and admirals who've come out against Trump have indicated. Thank you. We hope that those systems will stay in place and work well. Well, thank you so much to everybody who took part in this discussion tonight. Thank you so much, Professor Mushaim, for your really wonderful talk. Um, I think we all have a lot to think about. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know to check out further events coming up in the future, similar to what we talked about tonight on democracy. We have an event coming up next Monday with Nina, Nina Jankovic from the Wilson Center. She'll be talking about how to lose the information war Russia, fake news, and the future of conflict. You can check out our website, americahouse.de. You can sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to be informed on all the other events and um, offers that the America House, America House has. And we are also on social media. So thank you so much once again, Professor Musaven. Thank you, we everybody. We look forward to having you again. Uh -huh. My pleasure. Thank you.